So good morning, everyone. I hope you're ready to do some work because we're going to make this very, very practical. You see, everything was fine until six weeks ago, seven weeks ago. We were all on track at the beginning of the year. We had some plans. A lot of the businesses I'd spoken to, both here in the US and the UK, had growth plans ahead of them. Everyone was excited about the year, despite the problems we've had in South Africa with very slow economic growth and troublesome electrical power supplies. We as South Africans have become fairly resilient. We had taken some time out over the December period. We had decided how we were going to adapt to these challenging environments and we have plans to get going. Then what happened six months ago? We got punched in the face. And as we did, all our plans dissolved and faded away. Mike Tyson used to always say to sports commentators when they said, I'm Mike, what's your plan based on your opponent's plan to defeat you? And he said, punch them in the face. And I'd say, but what does that mean? He said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. It's so true. The difference, however, is that winners get up. And in, I think it was his uh, more or less about 56th fight, somewhere around there, he had been undefeated until he had fought a no-name brand, a chap called Buster Douglas, who had a very sketchy record and was really a filler fight. He got knocked down onto the tarmac by Mike Tyson in the eighth round. And in the 10th round, because he got up, he was the first boxer ever to knock Mike Tyson out. This is a fighting webinar. I hope you enjoy it. Please ask questions directly through the chat line. I will try and attend to them as we move to the end piece of the webinar. I have a producer helping me to guide me through the questions. There's a lot to cover. Get your questions asked. It's a real opportunity for you to share your thoughts, your heart, your mind, with a broader audience and for us to try and find different ways of helping you get to the other side of this economy. So we have to take a view on the future. There's only one view that any entrepreneur will have around that view. And that is that you must prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Hoping for something better when, well, hope is not a strategy. Let me put it to you that simply. If we expect things to be bad, it means we will build our actions, our businesses, to survive a bad environment. If things are even slightly better, it puts us in a position where everything we've done will simply be amplified in the benefits it yields for us. In order to get some objectivity around this environment, and objectivity is so important, to get that objectivity gives you a perspective. It lets you stand apart from yourself, apart from your business, and to look at your business almost as an object, an object that you need to cradle and guide, an object that you need to support and hold to get to the other side of a very, very stormy sea. If you see yourself as part of that business, the emotions that rush through your head cloud judgment. And we have a canny way of getting this done right. So imagine your business to be similar to a ship and imagine yourself to be the captain of that ship. I remember as a youngster, Jacques Cousteau was just inspirational. I was convinced for many, many years I was going to become a marine biologist because on the Calypso, his ship over here, he used to sail into the seas and discover the underworld of the oceans. If you look at the ship, I'm going to talk you through how it's no different to your business and how you should be no different to Jacques Cousteau. In the first instance, a good captain understands the ocean. We are all sailing in a very, very stormy sea at the moment. And here is the position that I think we should all be assuming. COVID is here to stay for at least the next 24 months. Over that period, I'm not sure we'll go necessarily back into full lockdown again, but we will move between level four, level three, level two, level two, level one, level three, level four, level two. The uncertainty is no different to a very stormy sea. The reality is, however, in that stormy sea, all of us are sailing in it. It's not personal, and COVID is not personal to anybody or anyone. It is universal. It's been felt here, it's been felt in the US, it's been felt in the UK, certainly with the business owners I speak to. The seas are rough, the seas are choppy, 
and we need to prepare for the worst. I think it's a two-year run. At the end of it, we will revert back to an economy that looked pre-COVID, but has changed probably by 30, 40% in terms of how businesses and how consumers have learned to behave. The next thing, every ship leaves a harbor and sails to a destination. To the extent that you're not clear on what your destination is, it makes it very hard to determine the best path to get there. Think of it logically. You set sail in your ship. You leave Cape Town Harbor. You start sailing to, let's say, Mumbai. But you decide, actually, no, you want to rather go to New York. The mere fact that you are doing that, chopping and changing that final destination, means that whenever you have to make a critical decision because suddenly a wave appears or suddenly a wind appears, what is that decision going to be guided by? Surely, as any good captain, it would be determined around what do I need to do with, the, with this wave, with this wind, to get me safely to my final destination. We believe there's only one destination for a business. I'll share that with you shortly. The next thing is, once you have a destination, you need to navigate to the destination. You must chart your course from Cape Town Harbor to New York. And you can see that it will take you 16, 17 days, depending on the capability of your vessel, the speed of your vessel. What a smart captain does is a smart captain takes 20 days of food, fuel, and water for the 16-day journey, because all of us can expect the weather to change. A lot of businesses have not been able to do that. A lot of businesses have not been able to build up some sort of buffer simply because of the poor growth in the economy but also largely because of unreliable electrical supply. A lot of businesses, especially in the social economy, have taken tremendous strength. The social economy, a significant part of Cape Town's economy, is around tourism, entertainment, restaurants, tours, conferences, events. There's some tough, tough calls that need to be made there, and I will share a strategy with you on how to get to the other side of it. All businesses, all ships, I beg your pardon, have to develop communications internally and externally. If you look at this ship, it has sonar communication, it has radar communication, it uses flags, it uses lamps, it uses Morse code, it uses many, many different means of communicating. The reason it's important in a ship is if any one of those communication protocols fail and you have no ability to either talk to your crew or talk to the ports that you're sailing to or other ships passing by, it leaves you completely stone cold isolated. In a business, we should have active communication protocols put in place. Are you using email? Yes, I hope so. Are you using a website? Yes, the two most basic forms. But what have you done to create internal communications when working away from an office environment? How do you talk to your teams? Do you have WhatsApp? Do you have Zoom? Do you have Microsoft Teams? What protocols have you put in place? Equally importantly, what communications have you put in place to talk to your customers and clients? And those that can't, what have you done about it? Because if you can't talk to them in the midst of the storm, how do you know where they are? How do you know how you can respond more effectively to them given their changed circumstances? The same goes for your suppliers. A ship, every ship, has an asset stack. If you look at this particular ship, this was a research ship. There's a submarine on it. There's a small helicopter on it. There's a dive chamber on it. A ship needs to be built for purpose. And all of our businesses have been built for purpose. Your asset stack is everything that you have in your business. It could be plant, it could be equipment, it could be technology, it could be stock. It's your people. It's your suppliers, it's your customers, it's your brand, it's your reputation, it's the relationships you have, it's access to your bank, it's your landlord, it's the culture of your organization. All of those stack up and rack up to be an asset. The longer you have been in business for, the thicker, the denser, the bigger that asset stack. We're going to learn how to work with your asset stack to get you to the other side. 
And then a ship has a crew. This one had 27 personas on it. And each of those crew members, I can assure you, had very specific roles. And those roles were determined by the systems of operation. A deckhand knows exactly what to do when. In good sailing, in stormy sailing. The navigation office or the dive chamber knows exactly what to do when for still seas and for tempestuous seas. How do they know? Because they are given training, they are explained what their role is in the broader occup uh, occupation of the ship and sailing of the ship, and everyone understands how everyone else has got their back as a result of them doing what they need to do. On a ship, your crew needs to be the right crew, and they need to do the right thing at the right time. Because when you're hit by a big wave, or you're stuck in doldrums, if that crew does not behave predictably, the ship itself is at risk. Then, for us as captains of our ships, we have a choice. We have a choice as to where we should be. We can either be in the engine room, which is deep down in the deck uh, below, below the sea level in the business. I'll point it out to you. There's the engine room. The function of the engine room, which is below the water level, below the plinth level, is it's a dark, dingy room. It's noisy. You've got big diesel engines churning away. And their function is to propel the ship. It gives the ship momentum. It does not steer the ship, but it gives it momentum. Alternatively, if you're not in the engine room, hopefully you're up on the bridge. And the bridge, as you can see, has a 360 degree view. It has instruments on it. It has full control over the most important thing, and that is direction. It's from the bridge that you control the rudder. For you as a business owner, all of us started in the engine room. If you have not migrated up onto the bridge, it means you're stuck in day-to-day -day operations. And folks, I don't need to tell you because you've all been there, including myself. Day-to-day -day operations is where Monday becomes Friday, January becomes December, the promise to do things differently next year is repeated year after year after year. If your business has hit a ceiling beyond which it cannot grow, it's largely because you're too caught up in daily operations. And why would you be caught up in daily operations? The time I go back into the engine room is when the momentum is stalled. And the momentum is stalled because now again, I've been asked to change destination. Finally, All of us need to have one single destination, one single destination. The way that we are going to get there will change depending on the condition of the ocean. What we had pre-COVID was a choppy sea, a choppy sea but becoming more certain. During the Zoom administration, from one Sunday to Monday, you never knew who was in charge. It created tremendous uncertainty. In the Ramaphosa administration, we have a bit more predictability and a bit more certainty, but still in a choppy sea with unreliable power and unreliable economic growth. We are all in it together. It's not personal. Be clear on what kind of ship you have. Be clear on your destination and the rest will then follow. So what should that future focus be? Only one, I argue. For any business owner, look at the risks you have taken to build your business. And most of you have done it with your own money. We're not talking corporate here, where you listed on a stock exchange and shareholders throw money at you and you manage and direct it largely through asset managers. Most of us find ourselves on our own or with a business partner or two, where we are then stuck within our own ambit of groupthink, or in a family where we're stuck with the baggage of the family as well as the way the family thinks. Most of us have done this on our own. For that reason alone, it's really important that you do not become one of the 94.6% of business globally that are started but can never ever be sold. Because we throw everything we have into our businesses, it's really important that we, five years, 10, 20, 30, 40, 45 years from now, get into a position where we can sell the business in a clean deal. The sale of that business yields a capital return. That capital return 
is what creates the pension and legacy for that entrepreneur and their family to get to the next level of life. That means the final destination must be that we build our businesses into an asset of value. It has three features to it. The first is, it needs to be a business that can grow its capital value. Think of it like a share on the stock exchange. You find a share, you think it's a good share to buy, you buy it for 50 rand. You decide to sell it five years later. You're hoping to sell it for 300 rand, 500 rand, certainly more than 50 rand. That's called equity value. The business or the asset itself has grown in its ability to perform and generate revenue. And therefore, someone would want to buy it for a premium over and above what you paid for it. The next thing, it must have income value and growth. You bought the share. Surely you're expecting that you're going to get dividends from it. And then finally, that share needs to be tradable. Because if you cannot sell it when you choose to sell it, it means you lose the opportunity of getting any capital value for it. And in fact, you might be losing capital value that you paid for it. For us as business owners, the way that we build a business determines whether it will grow in its capital value, whether it will generate income for us through dividends and salary, and most valuably, most importantly, whether that business can exist without us. Whether it be a lifestyle business or whether it be a high growth business, any business that cannot exist without you, by definition, is not tradable. That's the future focus that we are going to keep in mind as we traverse these choppy seas. So the first thing you're going to do in the COVID economy, when a captain hits a storm, you've got to get yourself under control. It all means it begins with you. And this woman, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, was an American Swiss psychologist who spent her life looking after grieving people who had lost loved ones. Her interest was really centered on how to get people into a place of positive inspired action. She argued that when you experience a crisis and when you experience potential loss, now in her case, she spoke about loved ones, but I'm speaking here in relation to a business because most business owners I know rely on those businesses, not only for their income, but for the meaning, their hope, their aspiration, their opportunity. COVID has posed a severe, severe threat to that business's life. The first thing that I certainly saw was people saying, no, surely it's not going to be as bad as it is. As you realize it is going to be as bad as it is, you go through a period of frustration. Remember, we saw people rushing out and buying toilet paper in the tons. In a sense, that frustration was an attempt, or those actions were an attempt to deal with frustration. What most people feel as they move down into the well of depression around the loss of something they care about is anger and fear, because the way things were has been severely disrupted. The status quo has completely left. You then move into a well of depression. As COVID came, I found myself there for a few minutes, very definitely, but I don't dwell on it. Some people can move out of it quickly. A lot of people can't move out of it quickly. For so long as you stay in that well of depression, the likelihood of you finding any positive inspired action that gives you a good result is low. The way to get out of this depression is you need to experiment. You need to do things differently to the way you did them before. You need to try new things. You need to think out of the box. You need to think differently. The only way to figure out what works and what doesn't work in this experimentation place is to do it. Because I promise you, the only truth you will find is in action. If you see what's working, if you see what's not working, do more of what's working. Leave the other stuff alone. As you get traction and you see a new way of operating your business, a new way of speaking to customers, working with suppliers, managing your teams, you take a decision that this is working and you then integrate it into a new way of operating your business. I titled this webinar, Reset, Rebuild, Reignite. This is all centered around here. Resetting, 
is all about experimentation. Rebuilding is all about decision. And reigniting, six months from now, in an environment where there are far few competitors than you have before, and an environment where those businesses that have done this effectively will experience the biggest growth opportunity they've had in the last five to 10 years. That's about reignition. What's important about this, folks, use this to understand yourself where you are in the cycle, but use it also to understand your partners, your loved ones, your friends, your family. Use it to understand your teams. Use it to understand your customers and your suppliers. Everybody is traversing through this cycle. A lot of us will move up, and when we see that things aren't working, or when we go from level two back to level three, or level three back to level four, the tendency will be for us to fall backward into the trap. If you understand how this works and you understand yourself within this realm, within this structure, it gives you the opportunity to control yourself to the extent when you can stay in the positive area of it. So how do you understand your business? Because that's the starting point of doing any reset and your clients too. And I want to share something with you, something that I certainly learned in a conversation with a man called Marco Tafani, who is the current CEO of Anglo-American Worldwide. And I met him about nine years ago, 10 years ago. And I'm so sorry to say this to a Cape audience, but oh, as much as I've tried, I'm really not a wine drinker at all. In fact, I'm not a drinker, period. One tiny sip of wine, and literally you will have me talking for far more hours than I already can talk. I ended up having half a glass of wine with him. And he said to me, what do I think of Anglo? And I said, you're like a big fat onion. And he looked at me perplexed and he said, like an onion, how so? So I explained to him the following. I said to him, if you look at the inner layer of an onion, the center, the heart of the onion, that's where the sweetness lies. It's the essential flavor of the onion in the innermost center. In many ways, it's no different to a business. The innermost center, that inner layer, holds everything that is core and strategic to your existence. And your strategy there should be to hold and guard it. I'll give you a good example of one of our clients. Um, I'm working with a very interesting client, funny enough, in the United Kingdom. It's a data analytics business intelligence uh, service that gets provided into the financial sector, the financial industry. If you look at what they need to do really, really well, they need to be able to get data, slice it and dice it, and then interpret it, and then present it in a very pleasing manner to make it accessible across the financial services sector. What does that business need at its core, and what is strategic to it, that without which it cannot possibly exist? It needs the ability to slice and dice data, to interpret it, and then to put it into accessible design so people can either read and understand it or see and understand it. Without that ability, it doesn't exist. When you look at your asset stack, you're going to look at all the tools and equipment, the stock and the space, your talent, your team, the supplies and the customers, and everything else that's needed in order for you to perform your core and strategic capabilities. This here in the COVID economy is what we cannot afford to let go. You might not be able to trade, but there are ways to maintain everything in your asset stack that's core and strategic. You hold and guard it. The next thing I explained to Mr. Kutafani is in the next layer, the middle layer, that's where the burn of the onion is. And the burn of the onion can be unpleasant if it's too strong, but if it's managed just right enough, combined with the sweetness inside, that's where the flavor comes out. In a business, that is everything that's not core to you, but strategic. So let's go back to the state analytics business. They absolutely need computing hardware, right? That is strategic to their purpose. Without the computing hardware, they can't do the data analytics, they can't do the design, they need the software, 
absolutely critical. Is it core to their business? Are they experts at compiling together hardware, managing the hardware, establishing connectivity? No, they're not. There are many businesses out there who have as their core and strategic purpose the ability to build up machines, maintain machines, ensure machines are optimized and working effectively. This particular business had it internally. And as the UK economy shut down, I immediately said to them, this piece, which has cost in it, needs to be put into the partnership level. I beg your pardon, the partner level. They went, they found a business whose core activity is to look after hardware, install hardware, and maintain hardware. The final layer, the outer layer, is the skin. And what do we do with the skin of an onion, folks? Largely, we discard it, right? We discard it because it's not core cool and it's not strategic. If I really look at it, going back to the data analytics business, what is not core cool and not strategic to them? Well, very simply, the provision of paper. That you can buy from many other companies. You don't have to make paper in order to perform the function of the data analytics business. So when you look at your organization, you're going to be identifying everything that's core and strategic with a view to hold and guard it. Everything that's non-core but strategic with a view to establish a partnership relationship. And then everything that's non-core, non-strategic with a view to source that out and buy it purely on price, quality, and reliability. If you have these elements in your business today, you need to shed them in order to reduce the capital cost pressure on your business. Now here's the thing about the onion, and this is what is so fantastic about it. A silly idea, a brilliant concept. If you learn to look at every single business like this, whether it be your supplier, whether it be your customers, or whether it be your compliance suppliers, be it SARS, be it the landlord, be it the municipality, to the extent that you can understand a business like this, it builds empathy. Empathy means I understand what matters to you and what doesn't matter to you because I've actually applied my mind and thought about you. There are many, many different ships out there. To the extent that you have used the onion to understand each one, it places you in the forefront of being able to have a useful engagement with them. So let's see what else we need to understand here. There are definite businesses that are high, high risk. And I'm so sorry about the tourism sector. It has been completely shredded, completely shredded. There are very, very few clever options at the moment other than to sit it out and maintain relationships. But there would be very, very little revenue coming through. The high risk environments, the high economy, the high uh, corona risk uh, businesses, you as a business yourself, in looking at your customers, in looking at your suppliers, should identify which of them are in the high risk, the medium risk, and the low risk. If you are very closely attached to high risk customers or high risk suppliers, can you see by definition, it increases your risk. It's important to have that level of objectivity to see which businesses in your realm that are responsible for your performance and survival are at risk themselves. The next thing to consider is size really does impact risk. I was speaking a little bit earlier to Tim around which businesses have been obliterated and whether you're in the high, medium or low risk environment, the smaller you are, the more at risk you are simply because you don't have that many resources. Remember, resources are the food, fuel, and water you have as spare capacity in order to get to your destination. Because of what we have suffered for the last five years in the South African economy, a lot of us are running with very, very low resources. So when you look at your suppliers and when you look at your customers, you need to empathetically understand their ability to do things or not do things with you based on their resource base. Included in the resource will be people. 
Smaller businesses have fewer people to work with. Larger businesses might well have too many people to work with. But the people that you're working with can provide a lot of support and guidance. I've conducted a number of turnarounds in my life. Each and every one of those that succeeded, succeeded because of the people who were in the business operating the day-to-day -day activities of the business. It's them who have the insight and it's them who have some ideas that often gave me perspective on how to navigate through those stormy seas. And then finally, type, type impacts action. You know, you need to think very carefully about the sector. There's some sectors that have been very, very severely harmed. The retail sector is under tremendous pressure as a result, but also the way sectors behave become very complicated. If you think about it, deep, deep sectors, like the mining sector that has many, 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 many suppliers in it, or the automotive sector, which has many, 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 many suppliers. Those sectors are gonna find more comfort and control or, or government um, support than the shallowest sectors. The shallowest possible sector, well, what could it be? A hair salon, a nail bar. In many ways, you have a few suppliers, but ultimately you're dealing directly at the consumer interface. You and your business, when you look at who you are working with, if you're working with customers in sectors that are at risk or very, very thin, you need to guard carefully about how you, for example, extend credit into those customers. If you've got suppliers like that, you need to keep your eye out for alternative suppliers should your current supplies not survive. When I talk mindset, you know, it's so interesting. So we've got this 200 billion Rand reserve that's been put into the banking system in order for us SMEs to go and apply for funding at extremely competitive rates in order to get to the other side of the COVID economy. Now I have huge issues with that. I think it's profoundly unfair. And I think to myself, well, why should any business owner, because of circumstances beyond their control, indebt themselves to a point that when we eventually do recover effectively as an economy, which might be a year away or three, you're working to pay back a loan that you were forced to take out of your pure survival. That's one approach. In terms of your customers, in terms of your clients, in terms of your suppliers, in terms of yourself, that is one attitude. The other attitude is I will go and excess that debt because if 50% of my competitors are thinking otherwise, and the other remaining 45% aren't resetting to rebuild, yes, I'll have the debt, but when the economy does take off, I'll be operating in a far less competitive space with a far more valuable offer to my business. Folks, it's important. Use the onion and use these broad brush sweeps to not only understand yourself, but everyone else that decides and determines your performance and survival. That means every single supplier and every single customer too. Okay, so now we've got a good view of how to figure out our businesses and understand it. What I'm now gonna to talk to you about is how you determine your strategy. And after that, I'm gonna to talk to you about how you bring that strategy to life. There are three strategies that you have a red, amber, and green. During lockdown, the strategy is save and reset my business. That means whatever it takes, you preserve capital. Stop all the costs that do not kill your business. And yes, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to get involved in, in disputes with landlords, disputes with the municipality, disputes with team, staff, suppliers. Stop all running costs out of your business before you engage in negotiation. You cannot afford to lose any spare capital you have in your business in a safe and reset environment. It's capital preservation to the extreme. Once you have stopped those costs, don't kill your business. You need to then engage your team. Leadership at this point in time is critical. Yes, I know you fear your business, but I can assure you, employees 
fear their loss of economy too. Those people that lose jobs during this period are unlikely to find them anytime soon. And everyone is heightened around that. Leadership from you by stating very clearly what your plan is during the save and reset period, whether it be in full lockdown or level four or level three, depending on what sector and industry you're in, needs to be communicated across your team. Remember, what we're trying to do here is give clear direction, show confidence that we have a plan, and yes, the tactics behind the plan might change from day to day, but the overall strategic plan is save and reset my business. That means you need to be able to talk to your team. The first layer of digitization, which is all about establishing communications, be it through Zoom, be it through uh, social media, be it through WhatsApp, be it through Microsoft Teams or Skype, needs to be put in place. If you cannot talk to your team and your team don't know where you are at and how you're thinking, your team will work against you as much as you feel they are working against you. At that point in time, once you've got your team safe with the view on the uncertainty, but with the plan clearly communicated, you then, after you've stopped all the costs running through your business, engage your suppliers and customers. From customers' perspectives, folks, look after those customers who have looked after you. When you have new customers coming on board, because you happen to be in a favorable part of the economy, let's say essential services. And I saw this in the early stage. Chemical companies suddenly were providing some sorts of, of sanitizers, surface sanitizers and hand sanitizers. And one of our big clients turned around and said to me, Pablo, what do I do? I said, why? They said, we've been approached by a whole lot of corporates for supply. I said, uh-huh. Where were they pre-COVID? No, they were importing from China pre-COVID. I said, and have you approached them pre-COVID? Absolutely we have. But now that China can't supply, they're coming to my door. My response to him in that instance was, do not use this as an opportunity to get new customers on board. Use it first and foremost as an opportunity to secure the customers that have been loyal to you. In the instance that you have stock available, then supply it to the new customers on a COD basis so that you can build your capital reserve and offer yourself a buffer. Exhaust all support. Folks, it's constantly changing, but I'm gonna caution you on something. If the support comes with terms and conditions attached and you don't meet the criteria of that support, whether it be from government, whether it be from your local council, whether it be from a corporate, whether it be the solidarity fund or some other philanthropic effort. Pay no attention to it. You know, I listened to the, the absolute stupidity of, our, of the remarks that came out of our, our minister, where he said it's unfair to engage in e-commerce. It's unfair to other businesses that can't. Here is the perfect opportunity for us to move into an environment where we can digitize companies right across South Africa. Now, if you were in an environment where you were subject to that form of thinking, sitting and complaining and bemoaning your fate and saying it's wrong and kicking up a fuss, none of that in the midst of a crisis helps. Do not get dismayed, do not get frustrated, do not get angry if the access that you are seeking excludes you for whatever reason. Because the moment you do that, you're going to slip back down into the negative side of the Kubler-Ross curve. And I can promise you that when you develop a negative disposition to any environment, you will not see the signals of opportunity and everything will start trans translating into negativity as a whole. Post lockdown, once we're out of the red in your business, you're going to move into the amber, which is survive and rebuild. So we reset in red, we rebuild in amber. What does that mean? Well, if you've had really good conversations during the red phase with your suppliers, with your customers and clients, and you've understood clearly what they need done differently by you in order to support you, okay? Kind of buying and selling 101, right? If you don't understand what you do that's valuable for your client or customer 
it means you don't understand your business. To understand your business, logically, you must understand your client or customer. The red phase is where you have the conversations to ask them. Pre-COVID, this is what we did that you found valuable. Post-COVID, what would be valuable to you because your circumstances, client and customer, have changed. Those conversations start to get tested in the rebuild period. This means that you can go back into the economy ever so slightly, tentatively, slowly, depending on the regulations. You're going to go back to your customers and say, during the lockdown period, in our relationship, we spoke about us doing ABC. I've done ABC. Are you prepared? Are you able? Can you transact with me? Listen carefully when they say yes, because you're going to ask why. And when they say no, you too are going to ask why. Because until you've understood exactly how what you do needs to change in order for that transaction to take place, you do not stop asking why. That's called responding to need. You want to lead that position in your business. Because I promise you, most of your competitors, if they're stuck in the wrong place of the Kubler-Ross curve, who have not thought this through as a strategy, will be doing what they did before COVID in the hope that it will give them the results during COVID. If you've adapted your offerings to your clients based on what you learned in the reset period, now's the time to test them with the view to get traction. The moment you do, digitize further. The first layer of digitization was communication. The second layer of digitization is collaboration. And what does that mean? It means that you need to be sure that you have active contact with your customers and clients through digital processes. Go out and send surveys to them once they have acquired products or services from you. Be sure that you have their contact details. Be sure that you're communicating with them on a frequent basis. It also means internally in your business, be sure that the signals coming from your sales and marketing are reaching into your ops and administration. It gives everybody hope and it helps everybody make the adjustments necessary to meet those opportunities. Invest in prospecting and efficiency. Your front end teams over here should be saying, okay, hang on a minute, what we're doing differently is working. Who have we not served before that this could work for too? You want to start finding new clients and new customers. Because as I mentioned, competitors who have not done this work will find themselves no longer relevant to their former clients and customers. And those former clients of customers who you never had before become your future clients and customers. You want to look at areas of efficiency. Folks, I can promise you, we need to all drop our cost of operations. And a large part of that relies on the development of systems to support these uh, activities. Let's pause there for a minute. What is a system? It's not technology. A system is a series of activities in a sequence that can be measured and taught. So think of a marketing system in its simplest form. If you decide that marketing to your customers by email is what they want, because you learned that during the reset period, you're going to create an email marketing system. You're going to, on the 15th of the month, write up content in the email that talks about what you can offer your clients. You're going to put a picture with it that's relevant. You're going to lock and load your client database to send off the emails on the 15th of the month. You're going to count how many you send off and you're going to count how many come back with inquiries. That's a system. In marketing, the measure of a system is lead generation. In sales, the measure of a system is lead conversion. In ops and admin, the measure of a system is fulfilling your promises and obligations to the customers that have supported you. You need to build your entire business into those systems. There should be more or less in a normal business around 207 of them. To the extent that you built them like that, it means that the business itself 
delivers on the proposition to your clients. It means that these are the early stages of you getting out the engine room onto the bridge, knowing that the systems will give you momentum. It also is the earliest stage of understanding how to digitize your business. Again, these support activities are going to change. Find a reliable website. This is a reliable website. Use it, visit it frequently, see what's changed, see what's available, and exhaust it all. We've been through red, we've been through amber, and depending on what kind of business we're in, depending on all the elements that I shared with you earlier on how to understand risk in your business, as we open up the economy further, we're going to move into green. Accelerate to reignite. It's a new normal for you. So everything you've done now, compared to what you did before COVID, compared to what you're doing now, is fundamentally different. If it's different and it's working, it means it's right for the very choppy, uncertain seas we're in. It means you have the early stages of success already. And now, as a business owner, you're going to capitalize on this. You need to start moving from the engine room back up to the bridge. In the red phase, you are right in the heart of the engine. The ship has stalled, the propeller stopped turning, you've got to get it going again. In the amber phase, as you build those systems, you're moving between the engine room and the bridge. Now, in green, you need to be back up on that bridge. The engine is turning, the engine's working, it's happening consistently, it's happening reliably. You need to see what lies ahead so you can capitalize on it. Over here, you're setting growth targets again. You need to find access to funding, not survival funding, growth funding, because there will be opportunities to accelerate sales. I said it earlier. If you have gotten to this stage in your business because of these strategies you've deployed and applied, I can promise you 5% of your competitors will be there too. It means that 95% won't either exist or will be caught on their back foot. This is where you look to accelerate sales by, in a no growth economy, selling to your competitors' clients. The other opportunity is look for value. Oh, I always feel so uncomfortable saying this. But really, in truth, this is where you'll find yourself in a situation where you can buy stock from your competitors for 30 cents in the round, plant an equipment from competitors for 10 cents, 50 cents in the round. You will be able to acquire premises, you'll be able to acquire talent, you'll be able to acquire businesses. If you have not gotten access to the right kind of funding, and preferably equity-based funding in this instance, and the reason I say that is because debt-based funding has obligations to it that deplete the resources in your business. And remember, folks, we're here for two years. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Okay, so we've got red, which is about save and reset. We've got amber, which is about survive and rebuild. Then we have green, which is about accelerate and reignite. I want to talk through some of the actions over here that would be useful and helpful. Right, truth is only ever found in action. I've said it before and I'll say it for the rest of my life because honestly, I've never seen anything different. In the midst of a storm, sitting hoping for the storm to pass as opposed to moving and doing what you need to do in order to keep your, keep your ship afloat and sailing is really what counts. Each of these activities I'm going to share with you, and there's six of them, can be deployed and must be deployed across the red strategy, the amber strategy, and the green strategy. There's a lot of content here. I'm going to touch on it lightly, simply because we don't have time for me to go through it in detail. The first is, what sets you apart? I've argued that product doesn't, price doesn't, and service doesn't. And I've been arguing that for years. What sets you apart is your ability to be problem solving for your customers and clients. So therefore, in the red period, this is where you're talking to clients to understand their new problems. In amber, you're testing, and in green, you're consolidating, because now you know what works. The next thing is building your momentum. If you know what you are good at doing, you want to generate activity 
to communicate and get clients on board who like what you're doing. This is all about sales and marketing. In the red period over here, you're using relationships to reset, you're procuring intelligence. In amber, you're looking for transactions, you're moving from relationship to transactions to rebuild your business. And in green, it's all about new client acquisition. Fulfillment, if I know what I'm good at and what sets me apart, and I'm getting a good response from customers and clients, I have to be sure that I can service them against the promises I've made over here that correlate to the promises that they've understood I'm offering them for them to come on board. During red, you're talking to your suppliers. In amber, you're rebuilding your operations. And in green, you're digitizing as much as possible to make efficiency across all your operations in fulfillment. From there, you then have the right people to get on board. So folks, think about it. First, I need to know what makes me special. Secondly, I need to know how to generate income. Thirdly, I need to know how to fulfill my promises. And once I've understood that by building business systems, I can get the right people to do the right thing at the right time. I can get my team to operate the systems for me. What's key to this is that this is what gets you out of the engine room. As you look at it in red with people, you're sharing your plan, you're working with your team to develop empathy, communications, and understanding of your suppliers and customers. In Amber, it's all about them going out and transacting. New measures of reporting need to come in over here because in green, it's about setting targets and getting the team focused on running the systems that will yield to your success. What that does, these four elements, is a release of time for you to get back up onto the bridge. And when you back up on the bridge in the red level, with the time you have available, that is where you're going back down, as I said earlier, into the engine room. You cannot win a battle that has erupted, that threatens your existence by sitting in the comfort of the tent on top of the hill. The general has to become a warrior. You need to go right to the front line of the battle in order to read the signals, lead your team, and give confidence. Our time over here in red is in the engine room. In amber, it's between the engine room and the bridge. In green, it's 100% back up onto the bridge. The last thing I mentioned, you need access to funding. We know what it is. In red, it's all about preserving capital and getting access to any relief that you can afford. In amber, it's about being circumspect where you get access to capital. To the extent that you can avoid it, please try not take on debt. And the reason for it is because although you might think it's okay to do so, I challenge anyone to tell me what this economy is going to look like five months from now. If it is aligned to your worst case scenario, well then you've won. If it's any better, then you're way ahead. Be conservative around your capital preservation. And that means don't take on capital that has an obligation behind it that will erode your free income, your cash flow, your capital itself. Okay, so folks, these activities all apply during red, amber, and green. You're all in different places around which is the most appropriate strategy based on what kind of business you're in, how it correlates to the levels that we are exposed to. It's likely that you will go from green back into amber, or you will go from red to amber back to red. All of it depends on your own circumstances, but within each of those three strategies, you know what to do in red and bang green. And you know the activities you need to deploy throughout red and bang green.